I'll read Grant's bio for you all. And Grant, uh, I guess, uh, Sims farms together with his wife, Naomi, and his parents, Ken and Wendy Sims. It's located, or the property is located, in Pine Grove, which is northern Victoria. It's uh, a farm area of 4,100 hectares, includes 110 hectares under flood irrigation. They receive about 430 millimetres, depending on the year, of course, and that uh, varies greatly. Red and black uh, brown clays and a pH of 6.5 to 7. I guess peeling away the layers uh, of the strategy, the sixth generation farmers say its core aim is to build soil organic carbon, which he sees as the currency of healthy soil and the key to a more robust cropping operation that runs on fewer inputs. Grant says the main catalyst for the program was the yield gains that stem from Ken's introduction of no-till farming practices to the farm in the 1980s. Better soil, health and moisture retention through no-till farming led me, or led me to consider what else we could do to improve the biology of our soils and optimise its functionality and working, says Grant, who is also Vice President of the Victorian No-Till Farmers Association and President of the Lockington Farming for Sustainable Soils Group. With the mindset of doing what is best for the soil, the Sims family traditionally, or, or tra transition, sorry, from using synthetic granular fertilisers, such as urea, to liquid fertilisers in 2008. Grant says soil testing shows the shift to a liquid organic fertiliser program has in part contributed to a lift in the uh, in the P, pH range of the sodic country from 5.5 to 6, from 6.5 to 7 without applying lime. To complement these soil health sensitive measures, the family has also implemented extensive companion and ground cover cropping programs that aim to minimise soil moisture losses, boost soil organic carbon, stimulate soil biology, reduce pests and disease pressures and provide a cost effective nutrient supply. These diverse objectives are matched by a diversity of crops. In 2016, for example, the Sims planted ground cover crops containing a mix of 12 different species on 200 hectares, five companion crops on 600 hectares, and three mainstain crops, wheat, barley, and milling oats on 3,300 hectares. Please welcome Grant. Yeah, thanks, James. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge or thank the uh, traditional custodians for welcoming us here today, and um, Phil and everyone at the CMA for inviting me to speak and share our story um, on our soils. I reckon it's great the uh, CMAs, those networks like that, Soils for Life and Vic No Till, and those groups that can bring farmers together to um, share their stories um, and learn from sharing each other. Uh, no one's trying to sell anything, we're all just trying to help each other out. Um, right, so I'll just tell you um, sort of our story. Uh, yeah, which is that one? Oh, that one. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, James said with Pine Grove, um, we farm 10,000 acres of clay soils. I'll try and rip through a bit of this stuff because I don't want to get in the way of, of lunch and, and that. Um, so, yeah, uh, the rainfall, 435 mils average. Um, as you can see, the, um, yeah, we're fairly consistent monthly rainfall, but most people would say we're winter dominant, which we, you know, we get a little bit more in the winter. But you know, we tend to sow all our crops um, the same time of the year, April, May, and then harvest the same time. So we've been looking at um, you know, trying to capture and use a bit more of that moisture uh, and growing things and, um, out of that sort of traditional window. Um, yeah, um, yeah, sixth generation, oh, I know what's happened there, uh, farmer on, on our property. Um, we had our 140-year um, anniversary this year. Um, that's my grandpa, he said they used to run, uh, you know, uh, draft horses to sow their crops. They, he said they used to run nine horse teams at times uh, for three hours, unhook them, then run another nine for another three hours. He said it, it used to take him about um, two weeks to put 65 hectares in. Uh, today we're running 350 horses 
and we can do that same area in about four hours. So um, technology, and we're not working as hard like uh, Susan said last night, we just sit in a tractor and push a button pretty much, so really hard working farmers. Um, the harvesting, we're running a stripper front, which I'll talk about uh, later. For um, It helps with our uh, efficiencies. We can go in, say, a five-ton wheat crop and be pulling off, you know, between um, 65 and 70 tonne an hour with the stripper front. When we go back to the knife front, we're back to about 35 tonne an hour. So that front, um, greater uh, capacity for, and we also have a 20 cent, 20 percent uh, fuel reduction with less wear and tear. We're not putting all that residue through. Uh, yeah, they used to run a four horsepower header back then. And uh, yeah, no air conditioning either. So um, yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, the soil health. Um, that's, you know, uh, what we focus on a lot. Um, I don't know what's happening with the slides here, but um, yeah, that's what we like to see. Good soil aggregation, worms, life in the soil. Um, like James said, um, I was very lucky to, to come on the farm and, and start working back there. That's my dad and his brother and my grandpa and me when I was little. Um, they started off no-tilling in the, in the 80s. Um, dad cut up some grater blades and half-inch bits of steel, welded them to um, chisel plow to go in uh, direct drilling into pastures, did an experiment and found that without cultivating the ground, they grew a two-and-a-half tonne crop um, straight up. So they thought, let's look into this, and then they started getting, you know, the, the knife points and, and going into that. So, um, you know, they, I was very lucky they paved the way in, in some of their innovation and, and things with the way they were farming. They're very good with the liming and gypsum and, and uh, getting the nutrition in. Um, so the chemistry and the, the physical side of the structure of the soil we're working on, but I came home and started asking questions. I'm always asking lots of questions and research and things. And, the three parts that make up the soil, the physical and the chemical and the biological, and I, I sort of wanted to know more about that, that side. So, um, 2000 and, oh, I don't know, why is that doing that with the, anyway, 2008, we, um, we, uh, we decided we'll go away from the uh, granular synthetic fertiliser. Um, so we pulled off the, the tank, uh, we, so since then, um, ten years now, we haven't used any MAP. We've gone away from urea. We stopped using seed dressings, fungicides, insecticides, um, and focused on rotations and diversity. Now, I always sort of stress that um, you know I'm going to share today like some of the good things we've seen that have improved the soil and, and soil health, and some of the things that are detrimental. But that's I'm not here to tell anyone what they're doing is right or wrong. That's for you to decide because at the end of the day, it's your soil, so if you have to do something, whether it's an input or, a, or an operation to, you know, to, to get a crop, you've got to do it. But you've got to ask yourself, is that decision you're making treating a symptom that's going to be back again next year to be treated, so we're just on that treadmill, or are we fixing a problem? And that's what we try and look at, to fix the problems in the soil so that then these symptoms start not appearing. There we go, now we're working. So this is what we started to see, um, you know, life in the soil and worms, and that's me little bloke. They, I love taking the kids to work with me, and, and we're very lucky as farmers we get to do that and teach them about life and the soil and, and the bugs and the worms, and, and we see a lot of those now. And he actually took some convincing to grab that worm because he thought it was going to bite him. So uh, anyway, but now they won't leave them alone if we go fishing. They just won't stop playing with the damn worms. and. Um, sit still in the boat but anyway it, it's good fun so I'm going to talk about some of the things we've done um, to improve our soil health now when we started in 2008 looking at the biology um, we did some soil testing and measurements and our cation exchange capacity then which is the ability for the soil to store and hold nutrients and water was around 11 or so, uh, 11 or 12 in some of our clays now we've got that up to around 27 um, the cation exchange reading. Um, so we've more than doubled our topsoil's ability to store and hold uh, moisture. And all through, so through other pa practices that I'll talk about, controlled traffic and using deep-rooted, um, tap-rooted plants, we've increased our rooting depth, which we can measure on our moisture probes. So when we talk about the farming area that we farm, we always talk about it in two-dimensional. We're farming so many acres, which is length by width. 
but really we're farming a three-dimensional um, soil plane. So if we can increase that third dimension, all of a sudden we're doubling the area we farm without even having to buy more land. So it's something we've been working on. Um, so 2015 was an um, interesting year. This is on some of our Terek country at the plains there. It's very sodic clays. Um, this was quite exciting to see on this year. We had um, very, you know, pretty average growing season rainfall, 159 mils. At grain filling, we had four days. I don't know if anyone can remember, it was grand final weekend. It was 40 degrees Celsius plus. We harvested that paddock and went 1.9 tonne to the hectare in grain yield, and a lot of people were cutting everything for hay that year. Now, on, on that country, years ago, any heat on the sodicity of the soil makes the plants work harder. They get, you know, to extract the water out of the soil. They would generally hay off. We'd cut them for hay. We've got no ground cover. Next year, we're, you know, unless we had a good, favourable year, it was back again. Uh, that same year, we had some uh, fertiliser trials we get asked to do a bit. Um, that was with uh, some synthetic MAP, which is standard practice at 70 kilos, and our liquids uh, there on the right. That, those photos were taken about a metre from each other. So that was in the heat of the day, 40 degree heat. And um, as you can see, the, um, the flag leaf on the, uh, the synthetic fertiliser had curled up. So I think the biology there is working and helping the plant through times of stress and heat and moisture and things like that. So we're doing this in the, the dry years. We could see that work. Um, the big test was then the next year, 2016. We had a very good, it was a great year. 317 mil of rain. We doubled our long-term average and m most of these crops only had 30 litres of uh, UAN or eight, oh, you know, 10 to 12 units of nitrogen. So. Um, but I must admit, it was I gave my wife all kinds of uh, grief because I was nervous all year, all winter, that can we, you know, we've got the moisture in that without putting the urea on, are we going to get to the other end and, and, and miss out because we haven't applied? But with, uh, when you get everything cycling and good rotations, um, we found we can. That being said, this year was a different story again with all the frosts and the colder soil. So. You know, every year is a challenge, and that's what makes uh, farming uh, exciting. Um, so these, oh, this is not working here, but um, anyway, I'll just talk through. So some of the principles we, we've been following, um, we started back in 2008 before being part of Vic No Till and, and knowing about, you know, all this stuff going on. And now I think it's great that, you know, I've seen, especially in the last few years, that more awareness and talk about this type of practice. Um, we went to the states and, and saw the, the soil health movement out of North Dakota and, and things and, and they were going on what um, Susan touched on uh, last night was, I don't know why that, oh I might edit it. Uh, maybe I've got a, should I try my USB? I've got, not working is it? Nah. I, it doesn't matter that, I'll just get. So anyway, we, we talk about eliminating or minimising tillage, keeping the soil covered, um, maximising um, diversity and rotations, um, minimising chemical and synthetic inputs, uh, stopping soil compaction through things like CTF farming, and um, livestock, funnily enough. Um, at the time when we were in America, it was pretty hot, it was our February, and I had the boys at home filling in damp, because we used to run sheep, and uh, 2012 we got out of them to focus on the sort of the, the stuff that had come out of the Wimmera with um, de-seeding and CTF and that. And we went over there and, and the Americans said, you're missing one thing, the livestock, it's, a, it's an integral part of the, the system. And I thought, oh geez, I've got the boys at home filling in dams and pulling out fences, so I sort of had to ring them up and said, righto boys, you just turn around and go the other way now and, and uh, we might need those dams back in. So, uh, yeah, they were thrilled about that. But um, anyway, and the, the other thing we learnt, uh, if you are travelling to America and thinking of going over there, and I hope this works, is what Rocky Mountain oysters are. And I'll give you a clue, it's, it comes from a bull. Um, <laughs> And it, and it tastes like popcorn chicken, so <laughs> it was something, you know, went in Rome. But uh, anyway, yeah, that was something different. So I'm going to talk about tillage. 
and um, and some of the things that you know we try and avoid and you know like I said if you've got to do it you've got to do it but things to be aware of you know obviously the soil erosion um, from wind and rain now, now this is an experiment of I did to, to demonstrate the effects of tillage and I hope everyone appreciates I've destroyed a good yabby net to do this uh, high-tech scientific uh, experiment here but um, on the on the left is some soil of ours in a paddock that we haven't you know, tilled or cultivated for, you know, 30 years or so. And you put it into the water and the goal malins from the roots and all the glues have just held that soil together, good aggregation. On the right is multi disc soil, put it in, as you can see, at full dispersion. Um, this is 30 minutes later. This one's just, just disintegrating and on the left, you know, we could take that soil out and nearly drink that water, a few crumbs fell off. But amazing to see. Um, now all this um, soil dispersion, if you think about that when we get a rain event, you know, all that fine particles all end up running in, filling up the pore spaces for, the, for oxygen, root passages and things to go. So if we can keep the soil, the structure in, the thing that destroys the glues that hold it together is, is tillage. So it's something to be aware of. The thing that fixes it is the root of a living plant. It pumps the carbon back into the soil, which puts the glues that hold it all together. So that soil, I actually did this test again when they'd planted a crop of vetch in. The vetch is only four inches high, and it didn't do that. It was amazing how quickly the root of a plant can, can fix that problem. So how do we look at tilling our soil to get the aeration and, and that in? Instead of using iron, one big term is use roots, not iron. Also, we use um, animals. Or uh, On the left is worms, the worm holes. We get a lot of activity drilling holes everywhere. And this on the right is dung beetles that we're finding now with the cattle we're running. Um, so I got asked once, have you ever subsoil manured and all that? And I said, no, we haven't. That costs a lot of money. And then I thought about it. I thought, well, wait up. Yeah, we are now. But we're making money subsoil manuring, fattening cattle and letting the little bugs do the job for us because it's hard to see, but if you'd zoom in on that, um, that dung beetle hole here, um, it's like a body grub hole just completely lined with cow manure. So they are dragging that manure into the soil and then, um, you know, really helping our subsoils and things while making money. And that's what I think we try and do. A lot of the advice we get given by people, uh, the consultants, We've got to ask, are they selling us something? What are they doing? You know, if we can solve some problems and make money instead of spending money to solve problems, that's the way I think is uh, a bit more fun. <laughs> um, this is another way we uh, till the soil. Um, this is the tillage radishes. They get pretty thirsty out in the paddock when they're, uh, so we make sure we keep them hydrated. Um, it, this is a uh, plant on the left, we did a soil pit. And they were going down this, um, some irrigated country where the roots never got down because they were always watered, so they never had to work. So we make them work, and th that root went down about 1.5 metres to the bottom of the soil pit, and it was about 10 or 12 weeks old, that plant. So incredible, the growth. The other thing these radishes can do is accumulate uh, nutrients. So this is out of America. They've got some great research and work out of there. This is phosphorus. Um, concentration. Um, I saw one with nitrogen and sulphur that had leached through different levels through the soil profile. They plant the radishes, test it again, it's all up in the topsoil in that tuber. Um, these are some of the holes that are left behind when they, the carcass, so you know we don't have trouble infiltrating water uh, when we get these radish plants. So you know we've sort of thought about you know you can deep rip, your ripping gets down 20-30 centimetres, these plants can go a longer way the cost of seed, you can graze them, you can make money while you're tilling your soil and you're using a plant rather than destroying soil structure. Um, the other thing, with big changes we saw is when we switched to a disc, so zero till versus a knife point. Um, the disc, so many advantages, we can sow through anything pretty much, it's incredible. It's green, this is unbelievably easy to sow through because these green plants are anchored so you just they just stay there, you sow right through. We can get through huge amounts of um, stubble and residue, which you know protect and armour the soil. And, and this is what we like to see. I'm sorry about, I don't know what's going on with the, the slides overlapping like this, but um, yeah, so these are sunflowers into a cover crop, zero rye. 
We get great protection and cover on the soil for moisture loss, weed suppression, cover, and either by stubble, residue, or living plants. Um, we were talking last night about the, the importance of that with moisture, but the temperature is a massive one. Um, yeah, we did some tests, part of Vic No-Till, on bare soils, stripper stubbles, cover crops with thermometer temperature probes. And on a 43 degrees Celsius day at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the bare soil was 55 degrees Celsius. So if you think about going to the footy or the school to get a pie, they must cook them to 55 degrees Celsius and above to kill any bacteria and germs and things in the pies. So we've got to think what our soil is happening to that when it hits that temperature. Um, on the stripper stubble on that day, we were 38 degrees Celsius. And under the cover crops, we were back to about 32 degrees Celsius. So, you know, 20 degrees or so um, difference just from having cover and uh, residue. And, you know, I think as a skill, as a farmer, we've got to make sure we're using our observation skills, whether it's on the farm. And I just noticed the other day, thinking about all this, we've got kids. If you've got kids, we've got a trampoline on the back lawn. You go to mow the lawn, every time we move the trampoline, the lawn is about a foot higher underneath that trampoline in the summer. And that's because the shading and keeping the heat off that soil, we get, you know, so we've got to think about that out in the paddock. Um, I don't know if this is going to work here. Uh, I've got a, a video of that. Nah. Nah, I don't know how that... Anyway, I was going to show you that. That's the stripper front. Now, these things are amazing, and it, you've got to see them to believe what they can do, but that was 2016. We had some uh, barley on some share farm ground that, that lodged over. It was flat on the ground. Most people harvesting were doing about 3 k's an hour and because they had to pick everything up, put it through the machine. We were going through at about 8.5 k's on the video, and it was doing six tonne to the hectare, and we were just flying up and back, and it was just like combing your hair, just plucking the heads out, and you get out, check losses, just incredible. So just another tool that we use to, to build soil, and, and that's what we're left with after the stripper front. It'll pluck the, if everything's set up right, you just got the backbone there on the, on the wheat stem, just plucks the grain off, it's all threshed out when it comes in the machine. So we just get it through the header as fast as we can, and we can really get some great efficiencies um, the other thing with the stubble cover, this is a paddock that we uh, took on share farming a few years ago and, and they'd, uh, the prior year they'd pulled the, the spinners off the back of the header to press the straw. I don't know if it's a bit hard to see, I don't know if he's got a pointer here. Um, they're they're the, um, the chaff lines from the, the straw baling. I went out in that paddock because it was wavy. Then those heads there are grown on the chaff lines and in there, that's the heads, they're all stuck in the boot, didn't emerge. We harvested that paddock, it went F3 because of screenings and, and didn't fill the grain. Our paddock next door with full stubble cover, all our heads look like this in the dry finish and we made the good quality um, uh, grain just by keeping that moisture in the set, um, soil temperature cooler. We find our crops stay greener another week or two longer, especially under the stripper uh, stubble. Um, so how else can we get cover? And I'll talk about this a bit more, but we've been growing cover crops for a few years, mixing. So we're just trying to use nature as a template here and mimic, um, mimic nature, really. And, and in nature, we don't have monocultures. We have full diversity like um, Michael and, and Suzanne were talking about earlier. So each plant does a different role, extracting nutrients. We're using like buckwheat and lupins. They excrete an acid to the soil that will unlock phosphorus and make it available. Obviously, you've got your legumes fixing nitrogen. You've got sunflowers, bring zinc up. You know, every plant has a role. And if, if animals are eating on these cover crops, which I'll talk about later, they just, they've got all um, minerals and nutrients from all the different plants. They can really get some serious weight gains. And that's where you start, you know, making some good money with these things. So that's sort of where we go with oh, diversity and, and rotation. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is an example of our at last year program. It's pretty uh, uh, fun with seed grading and working out silos and bins, but we had about 12 or so different uh, grain crops, like, um, and we try and mix it up with uh, cool season and warm season stuff, especially in the covers. Uh, so your sunflower, millet, corn, and buckwheat and radishes, and then all your grasses. And we do a lot of companion cropping we have um, for diversity and also minimising inputs. Um, 
So I'll talk a bit about their companions and there's, you know, you're limited by imagination here because like these are some wheat where we might use radishes and, and sunflowers in to get the taproot in to help get soil structure right. Um, you know, some of these things we can sow in the autumn like corn, millet, buckwheat, you don't even have to spray them out, they'll frost out but even in those four to six weeks they've got such a powerful root system, those C4 plants and an extra carbon molecule that they'll put in over the, sea, the, gra the winter grasses so they can really feed the soil and um, we don't have to spend a lot of money doing it like you know we can get second generation um, corn $300 a tonne 30 cents a kilo so I was talking last night we can then put that in five or ten kilos to so about you know three dollars a hectare whatever sunflowers at a dollar a kilo we can scratch them in and, and even after our um, winter crops are harvested you don't need much rain to get them going and they just go down and find moisture that our, our winter crops can't find and access. It's really incredible. Um, the second generation seed can grow pretty funny, lots of heads and, and that, but it doesn't matter for the soil, it's still doing a job and um, it's also pretty handy when you come home and uh, you've got a nice little row of flowers there for the wife. <laughs> um, the things to be aware of, like sun sunflowers are pretty tough, that's in the middle of July and he's still growing so they won't always frost out but you just got to be smart, you know, knocking a broadleaf out of a grass crop quite cheap. We can fix nitrogen with a legume, take it out or go through to harvest. And um, this is what we're, some of the things, these are beans and wheat. Um, so we're using the beans to fix nitrogen in there, got massive root growth. Now, you know, I do a lot of research and I'm lucky enough uh, in what we're doing to have contact with some good scientists and, and farmers from uh, around that are doing a lot of this stuff. And I'm told that when these legumes are planted next to a scavenger, like um, these are field peas and tillage radish, and these field peas are only three inches high. I, didn't, I should have had the top of the plant in, but the nodulation they're forming, if you plant these plants in a, in a dairy pasture and there's high nitrate, so they won't accumulate much nitrogen, there's heaps of it there, but if, if you plant them, or in a monoculture, but if you plant them next to a scavenger, like wheat's a scavenger, ryegrass a scavenger, uh, radishes, canola, brassicas, the scavengers, they will make these legumes fix up to twice the amount of uh, nitrogen. And um, they uh, also, like um, we talk about nitrogen, everyone, you know, what's the most limiting element in the soil? And um, most people say nitrogen. Well, nitrogen's very mobile, you know, leaches, volatiles, it's 78% of the atmosphere. But, but really carbon is now what we've talked about, the limiting factor in our soil and if we get that carbon cycling then the nitrogen cycle works, everything, everything starts to work and, and who would have thought carbon we can get for free from the sun, you know, through the leaf of a living plant pumped into the soil by its roots and um, if you want to prime that pump we've found introducing livestock really primes that carbon flow and, and the pump of carbon. So. Um, so we're using, uh, yeah, these legumes to fix nitrogen. Now they will share that nitrogen through to fungal associations of the roots to the to the other plants. This is canola and faba beans together. Um, but you've got to be aware that tillage destroys the fungi. Um, high synthetic pea and things like that destroy these mycorrhizal fungi. That is an extension of the roots that help transport these nutrients in and out of these plants. So. You can do all these things, but if we're, if we're doing some of the bad things of the soil, you can't progress, you'll just always keep going, staying where you are. So we've got to some point wean ourselves off these uh, sides, the, um, the fungicides, insecticides, and the tillage. Um, this is the beans and, and canola that year. We grew that crop uh, zero, oh, we had 30 litres of UAN up front, just because we do, but probably could have got away with zero. No more applications of N through the year, no fungicides, no insecticides, very little inputs. Um, it, it yielded extremely well. Um, we, I went into pick pods. What we find, you know, we can all set flowers on these pants, but it's about holding those flowers into pods. Um, on the left was our monoculture beans. Um, they went four tonne to the hectare without a fungicide as well. It set 63 pods per plant. On the right in the canola as a companion crop, we, set, we were setting and holding 73 pods of beans. So that's where our yield 
comes in. It was interesting in that canola when we'd hit a wet spot in the paddock and maybe the canola's been uh, flooded out or a bit, the beans just dominated and all of a sudden our grain tank was just going yellow. So instead of our yield average dropping, it was holding or increasing. Um, so the yields that year were really good in, in those companions. Uh, these are peas and canola. Um, we've done vetch and canola, lots of different things. Um, we'll take them through to harvest and as long as the seed size is a different uh, weight and, and physical size, they're quite easy to pull apart after harvest. Uh, we use a machine like this which um, we put the grain in up the top there and then it blows air through so we can remove a lot of the chaff with the fans and then we have the round hole screens that we've found we need to use that'll take the canola out and the, the wheat screens at the back there can take the cracked peas and uh, things like that out and then the beans or peas can go over the back so we can separate them and I'm told that people are now using these machines that they can pull apart uh, beans, canola and oats in one pass so you know we can do these things. Um, oats are great to have in as companions because they we just had Jill Clapperton this week and she told me oats secrete a water soluble compound that inhibits the growth of certain um, fungal diseases in, in our legumes and, and pulses and that. So, you know, instead of trying to use a fungicide to fix that problem, there's a plant that'll do it. So it's understanding and that's the way nature has worked for a long time. So as oh, Gabe Brown says, are we treating symptoms or solving problems? Um, with the fungi in the soil, um, like I said, the mycorrhizal extension of the, um, of the roots and we've got the saffaritic fungi that helps break up the, and cycle those residues in. Um, we have some NVT trials on our property every year for wheat trials. We find that we can see where that trial plot was for the next two years after the trial because they've done what they say best practice seed dressings, three fungi or two or three fungicides through the year. The stubble just sits there and will not break down because they've effectively killed all the fungi and, and things to do that and, and high inputs. Also the, um, the insects, um, this is Jonathan Lundgren, he's an ectomologist, who's that bloke there? Um, Darren in the crowd. Um, yeah, from South Dakota Research Farm, uh, he came over a few years ago with a conference we had. We set insect traps in a, a cover crop and also in one of our grain or companion crops. Overnight we found we caught 40 different species of uh, insects and not one predator in the trap. So we had beetles, we have ants, centipedes, all kinds of stuff. Um, and so, you know, we, you see the old aphid, but we need to pest there because, you know, what's going to feed the spiders and that? So it's all part of a cycle. And I think it's important to know the thresholds. Like people see an aphid, they're out spraying. But, you know, when we do this, um, you knock out all the, all the beneficials, everything. And the first thing to come back is the, is the pest. And, and that's why they're called a pest, because their ability to reproduce rapidly. So we need to build diversity and encourage the um, habitat. Um, cultivation destroys their home, get the diversity in. Um, Jonathan told me also that in the human population, most of our disease, oh, infections and diseases we get are bacterial based, but in the insect population they're fungal based. So when we run these fungicides on, we take out the good fungies, but we also take out a lot of the diseases and infections that keep the insect population in check. Then we run out with a broad spectrum insecticide and knock out all these guys, the predators. And this is just photos I've taken driving around the farm, seeing, I don't know what that was, but it looked pretty scary, some sort of spider in a hole. Uh, these are beetles now, I don't know if anyone can see, but these here are slug eggs. So we haven't got slugs, but if these things go and eat the egg before it turns into a slug, we'll solve the problem. So we've got to have these guys in. Protozoa will also, um, which are sort of um, little microorganisms, they'll inject those slug eggs and extract amino acids out of them. So, but the protozoa is easily killed with seed dressings and fungicides. So we've got to be mindful of what we do. And then this is a wire worm getting savagely ripped apart by a pack of wild ants there. So um, it's exciting to see and it's the first thing I look at when I go into paddock, pull back the residue. You see ants but do we see life? And, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, the kids, like I say, this was a lentil paddock we had uh, this year and there was the millipedes, Portuguese millipedes everywhere and I was a bit concerned thinking what are these things going to do here? There were so many of them. 
And I rang a few mates that grow lentils and they said, yep, no, they're the two worst crops that get hit by Portuguese millipedes, are lentils and canola. And I thought, great, we've got lentils there. But this paddock hadn't had an insecticide or fungicide for over 10 years and I thought, I'm, I'm not going to start now. And so it was a nervous couple of weeks watching it um, and nothing happened. And I rang Jonathan and he said, if, if these uh, millipedes are in a paddock that's been burnt, got no residue, uh, they've got nothing else to eat but the lentils. Well, sure, they're going to eat the lentils. But if we've got plenty of other things going on, they've got other food sources. He said these Portuguese millipedes are actually very good weed seed predators and eat a lot of weed seeds. And I said to him, well, then, uh, yeah, that'd be good if they had an appetite for ryegrass, but there's still plenty of that around in there. But um, yeah, it was good to see that they didn't uh, you know, do any damage in the lentils. Um, this is a paddock of uh, faber beans we had. Not very good soil cover there. It was uh, after a canola stubble, um, getting smashed by a lucent flea. And I thought, here we go, this is going to be a pretty ordinary crop. Um, but then something I remembered that I'd heard Gabe Brown say, and he said, as farmers, all we do every morning is we get up in the morning and think, what are we going to kill today? We're either killing an insect, we're killing a weed, we're killing a disease. So he said, how about we change that mindset and stop trying to kill things and let's encourage things to grow and, and, and see if we can change the way we think about things. So I started thinking as the insects as a symptom. So something's out of balance. Diversity, you know, Dwayne Beck says most things um, are symptoms or to, due to a lack of diversity. But I know these soils are low in calcium and that the clay soils always benefit from that. So we sprayed liquid calcium calyx on these plants and uh, crop shaw, which is a sort of an organic uh, biostimulant to encourage the health of the plant. Um, and that is that crop turned to there. And the little bloke in the paddock while we're spraying because it's all good stuff, it's not harmful chemicals. And these beans, yeah, went on to go four tonne to the hectare, no disease, didn't use a fungicide or an insecticide. So we just, you know, and that's a, the same spot where those insects were smashing it earlier. So we've got to encourage things to, uh, to grow. Um, we also do the controlled traffic, the CTF um, farming, which we uh, run on a three to one system. So our um, disc seeder is 12 metres or 40 foot and our header front is the same. So they match up and our wheel centres are on three metres. So everything, oops. Uh, everything runs up and down these tram lines and with uh, oh, that truck's on the road by the way, not burning up the paddock. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so we can confine our wheel traffic to 11% of our paddock and the rest doesn't ever get a wheel or driven on and we've found through that, um, you know, and using deep rooted plants um, like canolas and radishes and things, the infiltration we've done through with the departments on our tram lines and off the soil, off the tram lines are incredible and blew me away. We've done soil pits, tapped in the, the rings and put the paint water in and all that and found that, you know, over three or four days we can infiltrate, you know, five to six times more water um, off the tram line than on. So it's about, like we said, getting that water and getting it in the soil. Um, so compaction is one thing that, that inhibits that. And, and bare soils um, as well. And we need plants and these are some other things um, that we, uh, we use also, you know, with the GPS, the, um, you know, we can inter so and all that sort of stuff which uh, helps with efficiencies. Um, so yeah, it brings me on to the livestock um, which now I'm, I'm really excited about and, and my cousin and everyone can't believe you got rid of sheep and now you got cattle and you're banging on about controlled traffic and all that all those years ago. But um, these things are just amazing what we can do with these animals and using them as a tool to, to fix the soil um, if we manage them properly. Um, this is what we were doing, you know, growing covers and spreading chicken manure um, on some of the irrigation prior to a grain crop. And here we're spending $50 a hectare to spread manure out and I thought, hang on a minute, we had a neighbour over the road that had cattle, beef cattle, and not much feed. We've got all this. How about we get him to run his cattle on our place, spread the manure for us, and now we're making $50 a hectare to spread the manure instead of spending it. And when we did it um, that summer as a bit of a trial, I went out there with a shovel and, and 
following the cattle around, you dig in the soil and find you know, a handful of worms there, and you go to where the cow manures were, and it blew me away. I think I nearly lost my voice ringing my wife so excited. We saw that many worms under the um, cow manures, and she was like, are you, you're talking about worms here? Like, she thought I was a bit, a bit weird that I was so excited, but it really is amazing what these animals can do, and if we manage them properly. Now, the first thing I get asked of all croppers is um, compaction, compaction, I don't have fencing and all this sort of stuff, but compaction is another symptom of density and time. So if we let the cattle on the paddock and let them walk around and set stock them, then they will compact the soil. But if we can mob them up, just like um, Alan Savory has done a lot of work out of modelling off the African uh, animals and um, out of North Dakota with the, uh, the bison herds, you know, they were moved around by predators. We're moving them around now with these poly wires. And if we mob them up, like, um, we've built this thing or, um, that we put on the four-wheeler. Um, the poly wire hooks on there. We hook it to the fence. You just drive off. It runs out. We use these ring-top posts with no pigtails so they don't tangle. Pop them in. You don't even hop off the motorbike. And we can put a 500-metre fence up in um, about 10 minutes. Um, this particular paddock here with the covers last year, to get it to work properly in the cells, we actually um, put it, I ran a single wire with steel posts. And uh, for you, Ranks, I actually did it, so I do do some work at some times on the farm. Um, but yeah, it took about three hours to put that fence up, and then we run the poly wire off that. Now, we were running 125 head of cattle on two to three hectare for about two to three days, and moving them every day but also moving the water and the hay feeder with them because that's where the, you know, the most of the traffic comes in around that. And if we keep that moving, even on a, on a heavy rain event, with all that strip of straw and all that um, integration of the different species of roots, it, it helps sort of cushion and hold that soil structure together. And we just didn't find you know, very little compaction or effect. If it rained, we'd move them every day just to keep them moving. But um, you know, the minute they found a bit of bare soil, they just can destroy it very quickly. So you've got to be aware, you know, and even like looking at turnout um, places where we can then run the cattle off if it's going to be wet onto some some native um, vegetation under trees and that. And um, actually, with that one, I'll just make a comment. They can be on these covers, and they can the, the weight gains we get. Um, we're now measuring them uh, with, we've got scales and that under the crush. But if we mob them up, if you set them into these covers, and they'll just walk around and choose all the best stuff, but if we bunch them up, they get in there and it's that competitive grazing where they see their mate and they just go bang and they just start chewing at everything. And I say to people, well, I know myself, if I get up in the morning and have a bit of toast and peanut butter, I sort of oh, I have a piece of that and that. But if I go to a nice hotel in the city and they've got a buffet out and they've got yogurt and muesli, and I'm eating a bit of everything. And um, this is what the cattle do on these covers. They have a smorgasbord every day, and the weight, they're healthy, the weight gain's incredible. They're actually just a big fermenting composting machine too, so we can do all these composts and things, but the, the gut of that animal, passing them through into the, uh, in spreading that biology around. The other thing I notice when you, they do go off into the native vegetation, it'll clean them up like that. They're eating native biology, then coming back onto our pastures and spreading that around too. So I think that's quite uh, interesting and, and important. Um, this is another thing I'll show you. So this is up on the Terex on our sodic clays. This is this year. And we had a challenging year. This is canola and beans. And we sowed it, got extremely wet, then went extremely dry and cold. This paddock, you know, as a crop, had everything thrown at it, nutrients and everything. Very disappointing grew, you know, a couple hundred kilos of canola. Terrible. This paddock here, basically that photo I, I took facing here. This photo I turned and took here. This is a 13-way mix cover crop that was sown right next door to this at a cost of between $15 to $30 a hectare for seed. But, um, we spent $10 a hectare, oh, sorry, 10 litres a hectare of Calex for the cost of $30 and then the sowing costs. Um, this is the second year in a row we've done covers. Uh, we did winter covers the year before, and then we did summer cover crops, and then winter covers again. And what we're finding, and I'm seeing 
this is happening here in Australia, not just in North America or other places. They say when the first year of cover crops, you get an, if you if you keep some of those nasty things away that um, inhibit the, the biology to grow, it'll it'll get a, a, an explosions of the biology and things will start to happen. And the first year you might see the crops grow up to your knee, and then we're told year two to your waist, year three over your head, things like that. Well, this mix we did at home on our best soils and it grew pretty well. This on our worst soils, the exact same mix, same sowing time, sown, but it was two years in a row. The growth we got here was just incredible um, of all this uh, multi-species. We had, you know, cereal rye, oats, all that. I pulled up there and, and I was that excited. I rang mum and dad straight away and said, you need to get in the car and come up here and have a look at this because it's just, this is our poorest soil. You know, instead of, we'd have um, poor crops, poor yields, weed problems, all these things. You're just spending money on them, liming them, ripping them, doing all these things, and then you're still growing, you know, this sort of stuff that can happen in these monocultures up there. But we get the diversity in, and this is where it gets really exciting. We can, very low input, low risk, you know. We, we always, when you're growing a grain crop, something's always going to have a crack at it, and, you know, frost is all the environmental. But you're just hedging your bets here, because we've got 13, 14 things in, so something gets eaten, something takes its place. Um, the kids love it. They, they had the two boys there, and they jumped off the ute, and I lost them for about 20 minutes, a little... Little buggers, they, uh, they thought it was pretty funny and I'm chasing them around and I couldn't find them. But um, also when we put the cattle in there, they, yeah, the boys had trouble, they had to climb a tree to see. We were worried that they'd disappeared or jump the fence, but they were, they were in there somewhere. The other thing we're doing with the cattle is something that I got an idea out of North America also with um, the bale grazing. And this is something I think could be looked at um, so over there they do this in the snow when the soils are dormant. I think we can do it on our stubbles when our soils are uh, somewhat dormant. Um, you know, people always say, and I've been part of a, the GRDC stubble project, is stubble being a problem? And they're looking at burning or cutting or baling to get rid of it, a really good resource. But when that carbon is there, it's 80 to 1, you know, carbon to nitrogen ratio, and then that's out of balance. When that animal eats that stubble, it goes through its gut and it comes out at 15 to 1, carbon to nitrogen ratio. So we're cycling it. We've been putting vetch hay out in, and so we'll pick, this is like an area that had ryegrass resistance, uh, low performing production area in the paddock. So we'll put vetch hay, high protein, to get weight gains on. This hay was two year, last season, or two year old hay that's only worth 150 bucks a tonne. So 15 cents a kilo. We've got a weigh bridge, we can weigh all this on. They're eating about four kilos a day to cost us 60 cents. Then they walk around the stubbles and pick out thistles and things like that. But once the cattle move, the amount of manure and urine and that there, um, we're measuring weight gains on these cattle as well because we've got to make money doing this. But we're also trying to make money and fix a problem in the soil without using the chemicals and all that. And I think, you know, some of these problems we have, we've created from, you know, monoculture cropping, uh, overuse of chemicals, we get resistance. So we try and solve these problems with the same mentality we use to create them. We've got to start thinking outside the box and challenging the status quo and, and looking at other ways to do this. Um, how am I going for time? I'm getting oh, when you're ready. All right. All right. I'll just quickly wrap up now. So um, another thing that we, I've been told is that, that I just want to put in here that the tillage radishes are like a Red Bull for worms. The worm, and when you dig them up, the worms go crazy. But I've discovered another recipe. You add cow manure, and I reckon that's like the vodka, and there's the Red Bull. So that's a Jaeger bomb for the, for the soil, the party. And now we've got a, a real party going on. So uh, we just, the worms that explode under those radishes and manures are, are incredible. Um, you get these huge, big, deep diving worms that pull the topsoil in. Um, you know, and that, these are some of these crops, just the worm castings, which I won't, I could go on all day about worms because I love worms. Um, they're incredible. So, uh, yeah, I'd just like to say that um, I think to, to change the status quo and get out of what we're doing, we have to sometimes get out of our comfort zone. And um, to do that, we can't be afraid of making mistakes. And, and we've got to look, we always measure ourselves whether that worked or it failed. Or that, you know, that, um, 
I think we have got to look at these things as not failures, they are just opportunities to learn. And if we don't make these mistakes and have these learning experiences, we just stay doing the same thing. So I encourage everyone to just set aside a little trial paddock or whatever and play around with these things, they are lots of fun, kids love it and um, yeah, hopefully we can be back here all sharing your stories again.